Single parenting across the U.S. has become more common. A recent study shows 42% of American women would consider becoming a parent without a partner. Our take traveled to Colorado to speak with a few single moms who say the statistics on single parenting do not paint a complete picture. Shh, good night, excavator, good night. The term single parenting by choice is very much in vogue, but for the vast majority of single parents, it's not necessarily a lifestyle they choose. Not a choice in the beginning. Um, I think after you have fallen into that, I hate to say trap, but it kind of feels like one. After you've fallen into that way of life, it becomes a choice because that's your only option. Mm -hmm. Rachel Contezano has been raising her son Kingston while finishing college, a schedule that's often overwhelming. I have to make sure I go to school or finish school, find a job, make sure he has school to go to himself, and also make sure I have a clean house, laundry, you know, we, I cook, make sure he's fed. And so I think being able to balance um, everything is actually one of the biggest challenges. Rachel receives child assistance funds from Colorado, but for Rachel and for many single parents, keeping those benefits is a constant struggle. You have this, this, this sort of catch-22 when they earn maybe as much, as little as a dollar an hour more, and that maybe translates into $1,000 more a year, they lose seven to $8,000 in daycare assistance. The prohibitive cost of daycare, generally between $5,000 to $15,000 a year per child, is a huge obstacle to most single parents as they try to balance work, school, and taking care of their kids. Janine Jeffries, a single mother to four, was working on finishing her college degree when her child care assistance ran out. It was one of her older sons who stepped in to take care of his younger siblings, a solution that required a lot of sacrifice from her son and put a lot of the parenting responsibility on his shoulders. To have him as my support system, um, but he was the one who took care of them. And there are some instances, especially like if one of them gets a, you know, an owie or something like that, even if I'm here, they'll go to him first. Imani Latif raised her son on her own and today runs a program to help minority single mothers as the rates of single parenthood are especially high in African American and Hispanic communities. And I think there is a myth that the women want to have a lot of children. The majority of women really, really want their baby's fathers to be involved in their lives. Many single parents say that greater financial support and more time from the absent parent would be key to alleviating their challenging lifestyle. And joining us from Florida is Judy Romanoff, who is the founder of National Single Parent Resource Center. Judy created the organization in 1994 following her divorce and found herself becoming a single mom. Also with us is Ivory Tolson, associate professor at Howard University in Washington, D.C. at the Counseling Psychology Program. He's also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Negro Education, and Tolson has written about the impact of single parent households. Uh, good afternoon to you both, uh, Judy, as well as Ivory. Ivory, I do want to start with you. Uh, there are many people who are probably under the perception that there are more single parent homes in the black community uh, than the white community, but I understand that your research has shown otherwise. What have you found? Uh, well, the rate is higher among African Americans, but the actual number, there are about four million more uh, children, white children, in single parent homes than there are black children. And what does that say overall for society? What is the impact uh, for those kids and those families? Well, Single parent homes are very diverse, and I, I think the, the fact that we call them all single parent households uh, is a little bit elusive, uh, and it misrepresents who they really are. Uh, a lot of so-called single parent households are actually three parent households, where you have uh, a daughter who's, who's living with uh, both of her parents. Uh, so the impact on society, it's, it's hard to really say. Uh, I choose to look at uh, what makes different types of homes work and not stigmatize one home just because of its composition. 
And Judy, uh, your organization actually provides resources and tools uh, to parents who find themselves now raising their children on their own. What can you tell me has changed in terms of the, the dynamic? Who are the men and women that are now single parents as opposed to when you first began your organization back in 1994? Okay. Well, what I have found is that back in the 94, we had single parents that were more on the older side, whereas today we have a lot of parents who are the teen parents or young parents that never married and or took care of the legal process that needs to be done as soon as the child is born. It was really more like husband and wife divorcing compared to what it is today. Hi, hi there. Hi, Ivory. This is Kelly Goff, fellow Rooter. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm a fan of your writing. But listen, I wanted to read something that Slate published, which is from the Economic Mobility Project at Pew. And it says, um, the Economic Mobility Project at Pew suggests that children from intact families are also more likely to rise up the income ladder if they were raised in a low-income family and less likely to fall into poverty if they were raised in a wealthy family. Um, it, it goes on to, to give the numbers, which I'll, I'll make sure to tweet out after the show. But the, the fundamental point it, it makes is that these numbers show that whether it's a wealthy family or a poor family, there are still significant disadvantages to being raised by one parent, and my mother was actually a former single mother before she met my father, so I, I'm not, I have great love for the work that single parents do. But it shows that regardless of class status, there are still significant disadvantages to not having an extra set of hands, an extra set of eyes, an extra set of ears. And so I know you use the word stigmatizing, and my question is, is, has this become one of those things where we are becoming so politically correct that we're not willing to talk honestly about something that could help improve our community, which is that there are greater benefits to not doing it alone, and, and maybe we should get away from, from being afraid to say that? Do you think that being afraid to say that is hurting our community, I guess is what I'm asking? Uh, no, and I think that people who work in different spaces may have a, a different take. I work directly with schools. And one of the things that inspired me to write the article is I saw schools stigmatizing kids mm. who came from single parent households. Mm. Uh, so kids like you and kids like me uh, who uh, had a lot of potential and you know we um, may have had other resources, we had dedicated mothers uh, who were doing their best, uh, but as soon as we walk in the door there, schools were making certain assumptions about what we could achieve uh, or, or what our capacities were. Uh, so that was the main reason, reason I wrote it. Uh, I think that when you when you just compare single parents versus two parents and put all the conditions the same, uh, there's no doubt that uh, two parent households uh, have clear advantages. Mm. Uh, but but typically, the the homes look very different. So one of the things I pointed out in the Ruth article is that if you if you have a two parent household where just one parent is a high school dropout compared to a single parent household. Where the, where the primary caregiver has at least an associate's degree, the one with the associate's degree have a child that's doing better in school than the one with a high school dropout in two-parent household. Uh, so, so, I, we, so, so we have to be a little bit more complex in our analysis of it. And, and Judy, I, I do want to ask you, when it comes to the issues that uh, single parents are facing in trying to raise their children, it would seem to me that perhaps the challenges are universal, whether it's a dual parent household or a single parent household. Well, that is true, but as a single parent, it's more difficult because you're the one who's the disciplinarian when the child is with you, whether you're with the mother or the father or for visitation. So it's very difficult because of the fact that there's a lot of anger if both parties and extended family is not working together in the best interest of the children, which is so critical to helping children establish their self-esteem so they can be productive and successful. We find that children, they can go in the negative way and be self-destructive or they can go and be very productive because that's their focus. They want to succeed, and it's being instilled, whether it's in the school or by a parent or another loved one, that's being instilled in doing the positive things that help build self-esteem and confidence for the children. 
Uh, Judy, in light of these figures that are showing that single parent households are growing across the board, whether you come from a community or col of color or not, are you seeing any changes when it comes to legislation being more inclusive, being more supportive for the, to the needs uh, specifically for those single parent homes? I don't personally see a lot. What I am pleased to see that there is more activity addressing the abuses, parental alienation, children using as pawns to some degree, but I think there's a lot more work that really needs to be done and also assistance and criteria to help the single parents because so many today in the economy, no matter where you are, you're finding a lot of them have low income and they're really having the challenges that was just discussed earlier. Judy and, and or Ivory, it's, it's whoever wants to weigh in on this, but I'm going to ask like the ultimate and ultimate on PC questions, and I'm sure I'll get lots of angry tweets about this. But don't you think that the, the bigger part of this conversation that we're, not, we're sidestepping around is that we don't really take the concept of family planning in this country seriously? And what I mean by that is all of us, every single one of us sitting here, knows someone who had a child with someone that they probably knew wasn't going to be a great partner. In, in advance, and, I, and I'm speaking of people I know well, I love, you know, every person who's a great boyfriend isn't always great father material, but we don't have this conversation in advance in this country. I'm asking, what do you guys think about that? Um, uh, Ivory, I, I want you to respond very quickly because unfortunately we're running out of time. Go ahead, Ivory. Uh, just quickly, I, I choose not to really get into that debate. Uh, who I care most about are our children. And so when I work with schools, I don't care who their parents are. I don't care. But their parents uh, make a difference, right? Uh, yeah, but I think that there's school, there, there are things that schools can do uh, to engage any parent. And I've seen parents who, who didn't look like very good parents when they were 22, but uh, by the time they were 25, they got everything together. So it's a matter of do we want to take them on that journey to make a, a, a not-so-good parent? I agree, but part of that starts with telling a kid that the choice to become a parent will be the most important choice they ever make. And we don't have that conversation in this country with starting with kids. Uh, yes, I, I think I think that that we do have that conversation. Well, I, I have that conversation. You do, but More maybe, but but, it, but clearly, <laughs> not enough people are having that conversation. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing the figures, and we wouldn't be seeing so much so much growth in these single uh, parent households, even despite the fact that some are saying that they are choosing to become single parents by choice. Right. That being said, this is this has certainly been an engaging conversation, and it's certainly one that's not going to go away. Uh, Ivory Tolson uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for being with us here today, as well as Judy Romanoff, uh, founder and director of National Single Parent Resource Center, here with us today via phone from Florida. Thank you both. And as always, the Our Take team wants to hear from you on Facebook and on Twitter. Join the conversation at hashtag Our Take Arise. And remember to leave your comments on our Facebook page, Our Take on Arise TV.